Welcome back from lunch. I am super excited to be here in London. And I'm going to start off with the story. When I was 14 years old, I started working on a farm, picking peaches. And some of you might think, ooh, a lovely peach orchard. However, the reality was anything but. I worked long days under the sun, covering this itchy peach fuzz, working alone instead of together, because that's how they incentivized us. And even at 14, I knew that that was really ineffective. As you can imagine, I probably had a lot of time on my hands during that time. And I tell you this story because I realized a couple of things that summer. One, there was no way I was going to do this for the rest of my life. And surprisingly, for the first time in my life, I got straight A's for the next year in school. And two, I came to realize that there's only so much a single person working alone can do. And I realized the value of people working together and systems that can multiply your effort. It's why I became so excited about working with teams and computers and the vast possibilities of the internet. So I took some of the money I earned. I bought a Commodore 64. Yes, I am that old. All right. I got a degree. I started two companies. I did some things right. And I did probably a hell of a lot more wrong. And today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the things I've learned about scaling myself along the way. So I manage, mentor, and have conversations with hundreds of people. And some of the most common things that I hear are, I am so stressed out, right? I can't get it all done. And probably the number one, I don't have enough time. How many of you have felt that way in the past week, right? You know, imagine how I feel preparing for this conference, right? And running a job and everything else. Um, in fact, I bet some of you are probably feeling a little bit guilty about taking two days off from work and actually coming to this conference, right? But it will be worth it. It's been worth it already. So what does it mean to scale? Like a number of you, when I started as a manager, I was thrust into the role. My manager quit on a Friday. There were some frantic conversations over the weekend. And then a Monday, boom, I'm running a team. There weren't any good conferences like the lead developer back then, even though I knew I had to come up to speed very quickly. In fact, I knew what had been successful for me so far was certainly not going to work for me moving forward. So a little about me. Today, I manage over 200 people in about 10 offices scattered throughout the world. I have a family with three wonderful girls. I host a popular podcast, which you can check out, simpleleadership.io. Uh, I participate in outside mentoring sessions. I speak at conferences. And I play drums in a country rock dad band. So I do a lot. And I tell you this because most of the time, I manage to make it work. However, there are still times when I wake up, or we're dealing with a hard problem, and I pretty much just completely lose it. I get emotionally paralyzed, and I can't make any progress moving forward. Right? It happens to all of us. And I find my way back from that dark place by utilizing the fundamentals of some of these scaling topics that I'm going to be talking about today. So learning how to scale yourself is not a one-time task. It is a lifetime, personal, and professional pursuit. And most of you here are probably in rapidly scaling companies. And if you are, you should expect your job to change every six to nine months. So you must be continually preparing for the challenges ahead. Today, I'm going to go over a couple of things. Communication, prioritization, delegation, and personal development. And I'm going to be covering a lot of information. I decided today to go broad instead of deep. But don't worry, because I'm posting these slides and all of the resources I mentioned online on my website, which you can check out after this talk. So don't feel like you have to memorize everything. And this is not a talk about how to grow teams or organizations. It's really about how to scale you as an individual to give you a foundation to help you take back control of some of that chaos in your life, and to help you all scale. Let's start with communication. Why is communication so important? Well, I mean, how many times have misunderstandings caused you delays, or to get blocked, or something even worse? You have to learn to be super effective at communicating one-on-one. -on -one, and as you grow, you need to be able to scale to get your message heard by larger and larger groups the largest group, and have your message survive, being retold by your peers and your direct reports. As your sphere of influence grows, your ability to affect greater and greater outcomes increases as well. So you have to become expert at managing up to your managers, across to your peers, and of course, and of course down to your teams. A very powerful tool to help with that is called a manager readme. 
There's a lot of examples out there right now. And if you have heard of Oren Ellenbogen, he has a great new manager readme website out there right now. And I suggest you also sign up for his weekly uh, email digest. Basically, you want people to know and understand your expectations, your working style, and most importantly, how to communicate with you. Now, I want to touch on a subject that most developers don't pay enough attention to, personal branding and self-promotion. In order for your good performance to have any effect on your career, somebody out there has to notice your good performance. And that requires probably more self-promotion than many people here in this audience today are probably willing to do or feel comfortable with. Most people in this room are engineers. I am. We value logic. We value efficiency. We care about getting the work done. And to us, that should be all that matters. But sadly, that's not always the case. I learned this very valuable lesson from a mentor advisor of mine. He basically said that telling and showing people your work and the value of your work is sometimes more important than the work itself. So what can you do? You can send your email. You send your manager a weekly email, any accomplishments you've made. You can send some things to the entire company. Be proud of what you do. Speak up. I know this can be hard for some people, especially introverts. Take initiatives on some of those higher visibility projects. And genuinely praise other people. And you need to have confidence. Communication is not just about speaking and writing. You need to scale the perception of yourself and the perception of others about you. Confidence is a positive feedback loop for attracting others to you. In fact, overconfidence has been shown to be a significant factor in increasing productivity and lowering stress levels, according to the US Army study. In Amy Cuddle's seminal TED Talk, Your Body Language May Shape Who You Are, she shows how the power of confidence and how your body posture can actually increase your self-confidence by performing power poses. Now, the TLDR of this, this TED Talk is basically you have to imitate a gorilla, OK? And it is the biggest study show, so far that shows that you can fake it till you make it. However, I offer a word of caution. <laughs> this can be very, very similar to manspreading, OK? It's to be done backstage or in your office. Don't do it on the tube or in a public place, OK? Now, although being overconfident can help you, being falsely confident will certainly hurt you. So don't let your weaknesses blind you. And how do you go about doing that? You need to get honest feedback. Some people have talked about this already today. The ability to give, solicit, and receive feedback is a super critical communication skill to master. How many of you here really think you have a good idea of what your weaknesses are? Netflix junkies excluded, OK. And, um, and of you, how many of you are actually working proactively to improve them? Feedback-seeking behavior is linked to higher job satisfaction, faster adaptation in a new role. And remember, I said your job is going to change every six to nine months. And seeking out specifically the negative feedback has been linked to higher job satisfaction and performance across the board, according to Douglas Stone, author of Thanks for the Feedback, a book that I highly recommend you read. Now, how do you gather this appropriate feedback? The very first thing you need to make sure you do is you need to provide a safe environment where people feel comfortable talking to you. You can't bite someone's head off if they say something that you don't really like, OK? Make expecting consequence-free feedback part of your manager read me. Here are two ways that I do it. I solicit feedback all the time in one-on-ones, in casual conversations. And I make sure I ask very, very specific questions, not, hey, how did I do? But was my reason for changing priorities OK? and strong enough at my last staff meeting. The more specific questions you ask, the more valuable feedback that you're going to get. I also use the Google Manager Feedback Survey to solicit more quantitative feedback from my team and all my managers on it. And you can find a download to this on my website, that I'll, the links I'll show you later. Now, I'll wrap up this section with one final question. How many of you here today have said yes to something recently, but your inner voice was screaming no? because you already had too much on your plate, right? Lots of people. It happens all the time. 
and it doesn't feel good. Probably the single most important communication skill you can learn as a leader is how to say no. And along with it, how to say no without feeling guilty inside. You have to get rid of that guilt. You must be respectful, but completely unapologetic. And as Warren Buffett said, the difference between successful people and really successful people is that the really successful people say no to almost everything. So now you've maybe dust your, dusted your ego off after getting some unhappy feedback. You're saying no to everyone in sight. It's time to start some planning. I want to do a little time experiment with everyone, OK? In a moment, I'm going to ask every single one of you to close your eyes. Now, I know asking people to close their eyes in a darkened, warm auditorium after lunch can be risky, OK? <laughs> Let's go on faith here. This timer is going to count up when I start it. When I say glow, go, I want everyone to close their eyes and open them when you think 30 seconds has passed. No peeking, and try not to do any internal counting. I'm going to talk during this to help prevent that. OK, ready? Go. So if you think being in the audience is awkward closing your eyes, imagine what it seems like to me, right? If someone was to walk in the stage right now, they'd look around and go, holy crap, I just put the entire lead of audience to sleep during my presentation. This is probably a good time to get a drink of water. OK. Everyone can open their eyes now. Can you nudge your neighbor? He's still sleeping, I think. Um, so how did everyone do? Did everyone open between 20 and 25 seconds? A few people. 25 and 30 seconds? Someone not open their eyes yet until they open? <laughs> right? So the point here is that you can see how we all perceive time slightly differently. And it's any wonder, right, we have such problems estimating software development, OK? So people are inherently terrible at time estimates and time management. It's why we need systems to help us be successful. You can't just do it alone. So speaking of time, how much do we have? Everyone here starts with 168 hours in a week, and there are no exceptions to this. Assume we work 40 hours, give or take, sleep for eight, if we're lucky, commute for five, that still leaves 67 hours in a week remaining where we're not working and we're not sleeping. It's a lot of time. So how do we use this time? If you, won't, if you do not prioritize your life, it's going to get prioritized for you. This is George McEwen, author of the book Essentialism. The first thing you really need to do is you need to start getting data. I want everyone here to start writing down every single thing that they, need, they know that they need to do in the future. Don't prioritize these things. Just write it down. You want to get it out of your head. You could read more about this process in the book Getting Things Done. Now, there are things we are, these are the things we are conscious about what we need to do. However, there is an entire category that I call dark matter tasks. These exist in an alternate reality and are all the small things that we don't plan, account for when we plan. And it's usually by not saying no when someone asks for, hey, a quick favor. It's one of the reasons I am fanatical about not having any of my engineering teams do any work that's not tracked in JIRA. To tackle this, you need to do a time audit. Keep a journal for a week of all these tasks that you do, all these interruptions, all these quick favors. Feel free to just kind of bucket them into groups, estimate the time. You don't have to be exact. And now we have this list of all the things we know we have to do and all these lists of things that we get interrupted with. What do we do with them? We need to work on prioritization. I took over engineering at a company that was having problems shipping. It seems to be every company I take over. And during a prioritization meeting early on, I sat there and I was looking at some unwieldy Google document with like hundreds of projects and people were arguing about resources. And I just asked a simple question, which was, which one of these is the most important? I mean, the, the looks I got, I was just incredulous. And they, they looked at me like, well, they all have to get done like I'm stupid, all right? I'm sure you've all been in situations like that, trying to convince people that no, two people can't do 12 projects at the same time. Now, I think most of us have seen this demonstration, right, of how many things you can fit in a jar. Well, for this case, 
Let's assume the jar is our finite reserve of time of energy. And the large rocks are those critical things we have to get done, and the ones that take up the most time and the most energy. The small rocks are the nice-to-haves that can be done later. And the sand are all those distractions, those interruptions I was talking about, the things that don't matter. Well, if you fill that jar with sand first, you're never going to have the time or energy to really focus on the things that are important. And so how do we decide what's important? How do we prioritize? One way to do it is called the Eisenhower method. Basically, you can bucket items into urgency and importance. The first quadrant is things, you know, the site's down, I've got to pick up my kids after school, right? Those just have to get done. The second quadrant is where most of our strategic work is going to be, most of our planning. The third quadrant is delegation. It's so important, I'm going to get to it in a minute. And the fourth involves saying my favorite word, no, and just not doing them. Now, there are many different ways to prioritize your tasks. The specific method is really not important. Just pick one and be consistent. Remember, it's not important that you become better at doing more things. It's that you become better at doing fewer things. You want to do what's important and really not much else. So now that you have a basic prioritized list of all this stuff, how do you execute against it? Well, the answer is not multitasking. This is another major scaling anti-pattern. Executing properly is also not about quickly checking things off of your list but doing the things that were urgent and important, because that's what matters. Cal Newport, author of the popular book, Deep Work states, high quality work is produced as a function of two things. One, the amount of time you spend on a task, and two, the intensity of your focus during that task. If you increase your focus, you can get more done in less time, right? That's the holy grail. Now, I want everyone to think back to a time when they were completely focused and in the zone. Maybe it was a coding exercise. Maybe you're writing a blog post. Or doing something completely unrelated to work, jogging, or for me, playing an instrument. How did that make you feel, right? You were probably relaxed, in control, very confident. And most importantly, you probably completely lost the perception of time. It's an amazing feeling to get in that flow. So how do you get in that moment more often, right? When you're completely present and in the zone is when you are truly at your peak and able to get your most done. So what can we do to get in that zone more frequently? We have to engineer it. And the best way that I've found to do that is with calendar blocking or time boxing. Calendar blocking essentially organizes your day into time slots that are dedicated to a specific task. We all know that work expands to fill the time available to it. You can use calendar blocking to mitigate this effect. Make sure to understand your energy cycles and patterns of your work before you do it. Do you have more energy in the morning? Are Fridays and Mondays hectic with crazy, lots of interruptions and emergencies? We'll just schedule around that. Calendar blocking also helps with something called the Zargonic effect. How many of you had a hard time focusing because you can't stop thinking about that next thing you have to do, right? All those undone items lead to stress in your head because your brain can't let go of them until they're completed. It keeps storing it up. And it causes a lot of people to multitask because they think checking off a little bit on a lot of tasks is better than focusing on one to completion. Now, I can't stress this benefit enough. When your brain knows that you have allocated a time in the future to deal with the task, it completely lets it go. And it frees you up with more energy and reduces your stress and it enables you to focus on the task at hand. Now, let's go over to some of the biggest obstacles we have to focus today. As you transition from an IC to a manager or lead, you will invariably be in more meetings. They're like the dearth of my existence. Paul Graham talks about this in his popular post, Maker versus Manager. So how do we wrangle this back under control? First thing that you need to do, if you can, is delete every single recurring meeting that you have. I call it taking care of calendar debt instead of tech debt. Take control of your schedule by then blocking back all of the times at a time and cadence that you control. I know all of you can't do this because maybe you have a boss in certain things, but do what you can. And make your calendar sacrosanct. My biggest pet peeve was when people try to double book me or schedule over me, and I just say no. The next two items I'll be discussing, email and Slack. They're so hard because they're so addicting. Every time one of you gets a Slack notification or an email notification, Areas of your brain that respond to pleasure light up. And like any addiction, you need more and more of it to feel the same thing. 
According to the McKinsey Global Institute, we spend 13 hours a week on average dealing with email. So what can you do about that? The default state of your email application should be turned off. Just close Gmail, close Outlook, and that includes your notifications. You're like, whoa, whoa, I can't do that. Just think of it as an experiment. Try it for a week. I guarantee this is probably the single most thing you can do that'll be life-changing. Now, schedule short blocks during the day. Remember, put it on your calendar, time block, where you can actually quickly check off some quick emails and schedule a longer block at the end of your day where you can actually more thoroughly go through your inbox. I also use a bunch of tools that I'll post on my website, too, that help me you know, wrangle this under control. Slack. Love-hate relationship with Slack. Any Slack employees in the audience? Here today? So how you ever been talking to someone right, or deeply focused on a problem, and then you get a Slack notification, <laughs> it really makes it hard to stay focused. I could watch this slide all day long, right? <laughs> I love it, right? I secretly watch my kids' movies like this because they're so fun. Uh, get in the habit of setting your Slack notifications, okay, and your calendar can do your statuses for you. Make sure you set do not disturb when you're in your focus zones. Now, for both Slack and email, make sure you put your expectations and response times in that manager readme, okay? Create boundaries and have people follow them. I get a lot of people who say, but my boss expects, I have to be responsive, like he, he wants a response right away. Or I'm an ops and I, I monitor production systems. For those who are nervous about unplugging, there's lots of tools that can help you build a little personal triage system to handle that. And for those of you who have overzealous bosses, Come find me at office hours, and we'll discuss how to deal with that one. One more thing. To wrap up this section, I want to say be OK with, thing, with doing things good enough for the things that really don't matter, and really obsess about the things that do. So now that you've prioritized, blocked your time well, and kept saying no to more people, there's probably still too many things on your plate. The last step remaining is to utilize all of the resources that you have available to you. Instead of always saying, how can I get this done, as a lead or a manager, you have to start saying, how can this task or decision get done? Most of the best leaders whom are able to accomplish the most are also the best at delegating. In fact, not delegating properly is another one of the biggest anti-patterns for effective scaling. This was my subtle conference tweet hint, in case you didn't get it. So where do you begin? You have to let things go. If you truly want to scale yourself as an engineering leader, you have to learn how to scale your teams. Use the list that you created before. See who can do the work based upon their skill set and interests. Explain to them why you're doing this. And as a boss, you're not just dumping a bunch of crap on them. Right? Give them a plan with expectations. And remember, you want to set them up for success here. By doing this, you create a double positive. You get some of this work off your plate, help yourself scale, and you help your team to grow. As Bethany McKinney Blunt says, your job as a manager is to make your team more badass. And this is one way to do that. OK, now stepping back. Take the output of that feedback you got when I talked about in the communication section and highlight your areas of weakness. Believe me, there'll be more than one. You want to focus on your strengths and delegate your weaknesses. If you're super strong at something, capitalize on that. Don't water it down by becoming marginal at more and more things. And if you are in a position to hire, make sure to specifically look for people to hire to balance out your weaknesses. In fact, if you're hiring for a team, you should always take your entire team's composition into account when you hire and balance the team's weaknesses. Now, my personal weakness is attention to detail over time of a project, right? So dealing with it is so important that every new job I start, I look for someone and identify someone who can help balance out that weakness for me. Now, I want you to notice how I have explicitly called out delegating decisions multiple times. This is because new leaders not only limit their personal scaling, but they limit the scaling of their entire team by becoming the biggest bottlenecks around decision making. So don't be that person. OK, great. You're now in a good place with communicating, delegating, and managing time. But there's one more very important piece that is missing. And it's a piece that honestly does not get the attention it should. You cannot scale if you are not balanced. You cannot help your team if you are burned out and falling apart. 
Leading takes energy, so every one of you must start taking care of yourself first. And here's something that most people don't seem to understand about being the lead until they become one. It gets lonely. And the higher you grow in an organization, the lonelier it gets. As a VP of engineering, there's hardly anyone I can talk to about half of the things. It's one of the main reasons why I started my podcast. I get to have these conversations with other engineering leaders around the world, and it's sort of like my weekly therapy session. So find your own peer group. Find your own support group. Ben Coggleton, the CEO of Olark, sums taking mental and emotional care of yourself this way. We are in a knowledge economy. Our jobs require us to execute at peak mental performance. If athletes are injured, they sit on the bench. Why should taking our mind be any different, right? Mental fatigue, burnout, and illness among tech workers is a larger issue than many of us, I think, would like to admit. And many people end up suffering twice, once with the pain of the issue, and then again with any shame and stigma they deal with. I can't stress this enough. So how can we help ourselves and our teams? You have to make yourself a priority. I'm going to say it again. You have to make yourself a priority. As a leader, be vocal and openly supportive of your team as whole people and not just employees. Actively incorporate the items I in incorporate in my talk into your lives and be role models for your teams. Now, for me, the number one item on my list that helps me is exercise. And the benefits of exercise are far too many to go over in detail. You can read about it later. You can, you can read about it. But I'm sure you can see how some of these items might help you scale. Now, do whatever you enjoy. Tennis, going for a walk, even taking the stairs instead of the lift has benefits. Now, the only time that I can routinely exercise is over my lunch. So I practice calendar blocking weeks in advance to make sure I get the time. And I make sure that's public, because I want my teams to know that I am taking the time to take care of myself. OK, now speaking of sports, what's the one thing that the majority of athletes use in their lives? They all employ coaches and trainers. So why should tech leaders and managers be any different? The expectation that we should just wake up one day and suddenly be awesome managers and leaders is completely ridiculous. Every one of us suffers from imposter syndrome at one point or another. So don't feel bad. And don't limit yourself to just technology. There are many non-tech leaders who can be great mentors to you as well. Another thing is meditation. And meditation has shown by Harvard researchers that can act, it can significantly change the gray matter in your brain. It's been shown to reduce stress, increase memory, help with empathy and sense of self. So how much time do you need to do? Two to five minutes a day. I think we can all find that. The easiest way I have found is to use the Headspace app. You can do it anywhere, and it looks like you're just zoning out to your favorite music. What else? You may have noticed that I talk about books a lot. Reading is so important for continual learning and developing and maintaining empathy, which is such an important thing for reading. All of these people have credited reading as a significant factor in their lives for their success. Obama even committed to reading one, at least once a day during his presidency. I want to reemphasize one point. If you are in a leadership or influencer position, your team and colleagues will take their expectation and cues from you. If you make taking care of yourself a priority, your teams will feel more allowed to do it themselves. And in turn, if they manage people, they will make it a priority for them. Now, as I wrap up, I want to highlight that what we see of other people is the output of hours and hours of practice and hard work. None of the great people you admire were born with the things you see. Don't be discouraged. Now, you all came here with the expectation that you would leave after these two days with some new skill or knowledge, and you would improve yourself somehow. Well, I challenge each of you to block time for one thing on your calendar that you know you need to get done, and do it today. Get it off your mind so that you can enjoy the party later. Now, nobody is ever ready for the challenges ahead. Scaling yourself is about preparing yourself as best you can and then jumping in and doing it. Take on that hard project. Accept that promotion even if you feel you're not quite ready. Erica Stanley, engineering manager and founder of the Women Who Code Atlanta, summed this up very nicely in a recent conversation we had. I think at some point, I mean, it's, it's kind of easier said than done, but at some point you just have to be fearless. You have to just go out and take that chance. I think that's well said. 
The proper usage of the tools of communication, time management, delegation, and personal development will help you along the way. These changes are not going to happen overnight. You will slip. You will backtrack. But if you do these enough, they will become muscle memory and be automatic, freeing you up with extra energy for all the challenges ahead. Now, I've come a long way since my 14-year-old self, but I am not and will never be done growing and learning, and neither should every one of you. The successful leaders of tomorrow will be the ones who can thrive in these quickly changing environments, stay true to their core values, and continually scale to meet the ever-changing world in which we now live. Each of you in this room has a super strength. Focus on that, and there is nothing, nothing you guys can't do. Thank you. Thank you.